firstly, uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, I'm John Doherty, and in, in uh, the panelists here, who we, we got um, Rui and Fiona in the background, uh, Catherine Moore in the foreground, and we've got Jim Rumba and um, Jeremy White. So today we're going to talk about, uh, as advertised, uh, scripted workflows. And the people here that we've got to speak to us about this, uh, well, they need no introduction, so I won't introduce them. So th this is an issue that, um, that, like a lot of people these days, a growing number of people are using, using packages like, um, like, like FlowPy and PyEMU to, to build, build a model, to set it up with PEST, PEST++, calibrate, produce myriad of beautiful pictures. And, and uh, I, can see, I, can see the, uh, I can see the reason for that, and it's, it's reproducible. And for me, that's a good thing, because when I get to the end of a long modelling job and I realise I've made some dreadful mistake way back, and then it's all got to be repeated, well, it's really handy just to be able to go and change a few lines of your script from the beginning and then go and have a cup of coffee while the model's being rebuilt, recalibrated, reanalyzed, and the picture's drawn again. So that all makes sense. However, I have to say I do detect, I do detect amongst the uh, younger generation of, uh, of, of devotees to the scripted workflow that sometimes a bit of a sense of holier than thou with the uh, with the older generation who prefer who prefer the GUIs, and um, there's a steep learning curve here. There's no doubt about it. And um, there's also like, people, uh, other people who haven't had the time to climb that curve because they're preoccupied with things like field work and data analysis and writing reports and doing administrative stuff. And, and should they be denied the right to model or feel small that they don't do things the nerdy way? And especially when there's, you know, we've been lucky in our industry. We've had uh, we've had uh, good graphical user interfaces uh, going back a long way. Actually, going back as far back as Jim Rumba. That's how that's how old. That's how long we've had these good GUIs. And I, I was there when Model CAD first came out, and I think that was the first, wasn't it, Jim? To um, when the, the when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, yeah. <laughs> So, and and m myself, and so people should be able to, uh, people who aren't necessarily nerds, you know, should be able to not feel bad about building models that way. Myself, I do it both ways. I, I certainly am happy to use a GUI. I use other point and click things like Surfer and Grapher and, um, and Paraview and stuff like that. So for me, it's not either or, it's I do both. But anyway, uh, all modelers have got a choice to make, and uh, it's in the spirit of helping you make that choice that we present these two illustrious gentlemen to, to present different, uh, to present what their experience in using the two different ways of building a model and setting it up and getting it ready to do calibration uncertainty analysis. So with that, um, I forget who goes first. Who's going first? I think I do. Okay. Now, just a couple of things. Uh, at the end, they'll each each of these people will talk for about twenty minutes, and we can have questions. Uh, put your questions in the Q and A, not in the chat box. Catherine will be monitoring the questions, and we'll kind of chair things after after the talks. And um, and also, this is being recorded, and it'll be uploaded to the GMDSI website in the not too distant future. Being with John in that, you know, I think a lot of the uh, experienced modelers that I know do do use both. They use GUIs and they use scripting, um, depending on the task they're trying to accomplish. I mean, I do the same thing, um, even though I've written a GUI. Um, I know that the GUIs can't do everything, and so there are times when I need to uh, take control myself and 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 do some customization through. Uh, I typically just use. Fortran or C++, but I know Python is very popular. So, uh, but but what I'll be presenting tonight is what I think are the valuable points of uh, of what GUIs bring to the table and and why they're important. Um, uh, for those of you that uh, have a limited attention span, and and when they look at, and when you look at the report recording, you just want the high points 
here are the basics of why I, I think uh, GUIs are important. You know, each one of the GUIs that are available now have decades of testing and use behind them, so you can generally trust everything that, that comes out of them. Um, they do perform extensive error checking. I mean, that's something that when you write your own code, um, I would, I'd be willing to bet that 90% of you don't put any error checking in there. Um, so, you know, the, the GUIs have a tremendous amount of error checking internally. Uh, they're very good at facilitating uh, transfer of the model to uh, your client or others on your team that maybe don't have, you know, a scripting background. And, and, and then all the GUIs have training available as well. Um, you know, GUIs themselves are often include scripting and can be scripted themselves. So it's not an either or kind of situation. Even if you use a GUI, there is some scripting involved. Uh, and then tech support is something that, you know, when you write your own code, <laughs> you're also your own tech support. And, uh, and so it's valuable to have someone experienced available to, to bounce ideas off of. And then at the end, I'll just cover a, um, a, a quick example of, of a model that I want to talk about that I think illustrates some of these points. So, um, as John said, uh, you know, I've, I've been in, in this game a long time. And, um, you know, when I was first asked to give this talk, I was kind of amused because it seemed to me that, that we've sort of come full circle because when I got involved with modeling, you know, back in the 80s when, you know, when a megabyte of RAM was a lot and when a hard drive cost as much as a car, you know, and, uh, you know, GUIs didn't exist. So scripting was the only thing. Now, we didn't call it scripting then. Um, we didn't have things like Python, but, uh, you know, in order to be a modeler in the early days, you know, especially the early days when Modflow came out, uh, you had to know Fortran. If you did not know Fortran, you could not be a modeler. There's just no two ways about it. Um, and, and so to me, this whole discussion, as I said, I think we've kind of come full circle. So I created the first GUI for Modflow called ModelCAD back in 1988 is when it was first created. Uh, and that eventually evolved into Groundwater Vistas, which I have now. And, you know, so why did I do this? Well, uh, you know, really what prompted this was my, one of my first, uh, first jobs, uh, you know, creating a model. I, I can remember three of us um, taking a week to figure out why our model was crashing. And it turns out it was one number off by one column in a formatted input file and it took us a week to find it um you know so that that made a big impression on me and i thought you know surely there's some we can do better there's something we you know that we can come up with that um you, you know would make this whole experience a lot more enjoyable and that's when that's when that's where model kid came from um and and so you know the thing the thing about scripting is uh when you develop your own script, typically you're targeting it at a particular model with particular assumptions and a particular set of steps that you want to go through. Um, so then when you want to apply, uh, you know, or, or create a model where you want to vary that, you need to rewrite your script. Whereas in the, the GUI, because they all these GUIs now have, you know, over 25 years of development behind them, you know, they're designed to be flexible and to uh, anticipate that, you know, maybe you start out using Modflow NWT, but eventually you want to use Modflow 6. And, and that's a trivial change, you know, in a GUI where it may not be a trivial change if you're scripting everything. Um, so that's, I guess that's really the first main point I'd like to make. Um, you know, the second thing is that, you know, models are complicated and, uh, you know, it's it's very easy to to make a mistake. Um, and the thing about uh, most of the graphical user interfaces is, is because they've got 25 years of testing and use behind them, um, they do a lot of error checking in the background that you're you're probably not even aware of. Um, you know, as a GUI developer, every time I fix a problem with someone's model, I ask myself. You know, could the GUI have have prevented this? You know, could this be, have been anticipated? And a lot of times the answer is yes. And so what I try to do is is build that in. Uh, you know, uh, to to find issues. You know, that I see, especially common issues that I see people having. 
Um, you know, it's not always user error. There could be other things like incompatibility between model options and features or ambiguity in model documentation. There's a lot of that. Um, you know, and so having a large user base means, you know, I see a huge number of models every year and I can use that experience to assist people that use, you know, our GUIs, uh, you know, to improve the model. And as, as I said, a lot of it happens, you know, really in the background. Um, and, and I also said previously, you know, when you're, when you're using scripting, you, you usually don't put in error checking. Uh, it's extra work. And in my experience, it's, it's usually just not done. Even the USGS in creating ModFlow has very limited error checking in ModFlow. And so, um, you know, that's, again, I think a, a vital role of the, of, the, of the graphical user interface is to, you know, look for problems, especially common problems, and fix them. And, you know, and they'll, you know, I know what I do typically is just report, hey, you know, this was an issue and we, and we fixed it for you. Um, okay. As I said, uh, another big thing about the graphical user interface is when you want to give your model to somebody else, transfer it to a client, you know, hand it off to another modeler who's going to do some work. Um, if if you're all using the same graphical user interface, it's a simple uh, it's simple to transfer it um, because you have sort of a common framework. Uh, you know, also there's periodic webinars and seminars with most of the GUIs. So you can get training, you know, whether it's introductory or more advanced training on things like PEST, um, you know, those those things are available. And uh, also a lot of the GUIs have a viewer mode where, you know, even if someone doesn't have a license for the GUI, they can still open the model up and look at it. Um, so, the you know, the issue related to technology transfer with scripting is, you know, I know especially with Python, uh, it can be a little tricky to uh, tell tell someone how they need to set up their Python environment to use all of the tools that you're using in your script, and then show them how to use it. Um, you know, it's not as it's not as straightforward as simply uh, installing one of the one of the commercial pieces of software like uh, like Groundwater Vistas. So you know, transferring you know not only are you transferring the files related to your model, but you need to transfer. How do you just how do you even set up your environment to be able to run your script? So I think I think GUIs offer um, some advantages there. The other thing, as I said, you know, it's it's not an either or situation. You know, if you're using a GUI, you're still using scripting, or you can use scripting. Um, you know, one example I know in, in Groundwater Vistas, you know, what we've tried to do for complicated operations like, you know, for past SVD Assist and Null Space Monte Carlo and and things like that is, you know, the menus are set up so that you just start at the top and work your way down, take them, take them one step at a time. And, and, then, and then what you can do is you can add customization. And this is where you can mix, you know, scripting with GUIs is, is you can use the GUI to, let's say, get your past data set created, and then you can use some scripting to make customizations to it. Um, so you can you can combine those. Um, the other thing that I do uh, sometimes is, you know, even, even though GUIs are meant to be flexible, there are things in there that, that can be quite tedious. Um, but you can use things like Macro Scheduler. Uh, I'll just give a little shout out to them. It's a, it's a really neat little product. Um, that you can use to script anything. You can script a GUI, right? So you can tell it to work its way through the menus and do certain things, and then, oh, by the way, go run a Python script or something like that. So you can you can actually incorporate the GUI into your into your scripting through something like Macro Scheduler. So yeah, this is again, I think I think GUIs bring a lot to the table. And even if you're a real you know if you really are a fan of scripting. You know, you can still include those in those in the scripting. Um, you know, tech support. Uh, I think this is one of the biggest benefits, actually, of of commercial software is is the fact that you have, you have an opportunity to get you know get help if something goes wrong. We all joke about tech support, but for specialist codes, you know, like Modflow GUIs. You know, having an expert available, um, uh, in my case, with 40 years experience, cannot really be overestimated. 
Um, I, I see hundreds of models every year. I think I can safely say I've seen it all. And so, you know, when someone comes to me with a problem um, using our software, I can, I can usually find a solution. And that can be something like, you know, getting solvers to converge, uh, answering conceptual questions, identifying bugs in mod flow, which does happen. Um, and, and of course, fixing bugs on our own software. All, all software has bugs, even your scripts. Your scripts have bugs too. Um, and debugging code, including uh, the scripts, is an art and it's a skill. And, and you know, it's, uh, it's something you don't have to, you know, rely too much on when you use a GUI because, you know, it's not your problem. It's, it's the GUI author's problem uh, to fix the bug. So you don't have to do that. Um, so that I think is, uh, you know, a, a probably, as I said, probably the most valuable aspect of, of using a GUI is, is getting access to, um, you know, expert assistance. Okay. Let me close by just going through an example of, of why, uh, which I think really speaks to the points I've tried to make here. Um, and this model is, is called ECFTX. It's a really big model. Um, and it was developed using scripts. And, and uh, it also was it included peer review. So there, there was a very long period of development. It was developed by a number of contractors. Um, over a fairly long period of time, it was subject to, you know, an independent peer review. Um, and uh, basically, this model is used to um, evaluate water use permits in East Central Florida, specifically around Orlando, which, um, uh, I'm, the, if, even if you don't know where Orlando is, I'm sure you've heard of Disney World. Disney World is the, is the focus uh, of, of sort of this model, you know, in, in a sense. Uh, and it's where three three water districts come together. So the reason this this model was developed using different uh, contractors and different experts is because all three districts were cooperating in in creating this model. And as I said, they did not use a GUI; they used they used scripts. And the the biggest complaint I heard I was not really involved in the early aspects of this model, but the biggest complaint I heard was it's extremely long runtime. Takes this model takes two days to run. Um, now, granted, it's a big model. It's 5 million nodes, but, you know, it's only, um, you know, monthly stress periods. Forget how many stress periods. It's not that many. It's like 10 years worth of monthly stress periods. So it just seemed inordinately long runtime. Um, now, where I got involved with this, uh, as I said, this model was going to be used for evaluating water use permits uh, in East Central Florida. And so I was uh, tasked with taking this model, uh, bringing it into Groundwater Vistas, and creating a tool which could allow, um, you know, people that aren't, you know, expert modelers to use it to make decisions on whether or not to grant a permit uh, for water use. So the way um, the way these models typically work um, in permit evaluation is we start with a steady state stress period, which is no pumping. So this is, you know, before people came to Florida, when when, when all we had were uh, were alligators. And uh, and then the second stress period, we introduce uh, more of a current pumping situation. In this case, it was average pumping between 2014 and 2018. Uh, and then we go to a transient period where we look at the impact of a new permit or a change to a permit. And the problem was that when we went from stress period one to stress period two, the model would not converge. It just simply wouldn't. There's nothing I could do to make it make it work. Um, and so obviously this is a big problem. You know, I'm under contract. I need to, I have a deadline. I need to get this done. The model's not working. So usually what happens when I, when I review a model, you know, I bring it into the GUI, I look at it. And the thing that, that's nice about the GUI is you can, you know, quickly scan through the layers, look at all the properties, you know, look at the properties in context with boundary conditions um, and look at all the various options. And it's and you can do this fairly quickly. And and what I find is valuable is just by quickly moving up and down through the layers and, uh, you know, looking at these things 
especially the hydraulic conductivity and boundary conditions and so on, all of a sudden it sort of jumped out to me that there was a lot of pumping going on in layer two and layer two was, was categorized as a confining unit. So it had extremely low hydraulic conductivity and yet there was a significant amount of pumping in there. So then I go to the solver output and I look and say, say, see, yeah, sure enough, uh, all of the problem cells that were showing up in the solver report in layer two. Well, it turns out um, that in the western part of this model, southwestern part of this model, layer two actually is an aquifer. It's a local aquifer called the intermediate aquifer system. And it does have significant pumping, but because the focus of this model was not on the southwestern part of the state, it was more east central. Um, you know, they made the assumption, and this happens a lot, right? You you have to make simplifying assumptions uh, that you know, well, we're not going to worry about that. It's it's a confining unit. We're not we're not looking at water supply in that aquifer, but it did have a big impact on runtime. And in this case, the model wouldn't actually run. So once we we what I did was took um, properties from another model in the same area where it was treated as an aquifer and put those in and all of a sudden the model runs fine. So this is, you know, this is an issue where because the folks that um, developed the model and reviewed the model could not view the model in some, you know, kind of consistent framework, they just missed it. You know, they just didn't notice it. And uh, you know this this was this was a big issue, and now this has been cleared up, and the model runs fine. Um, there was also another another point during the calibration. Um, I got involved very very briefly because I was working on a model in the same area, and and the goal was to make the properties in that model consistent with this new ECFTX model. And again, I just looked at the properties very quickly in the GUI and noticed that transmissivities in one of the layers were like <laughs> completely out of control they were like 10 to the eighth you know square feet per day which is completely un you know unrealistic um and again it, they just they just missed it right they, they just because they weren't able to view everything um consistently in a gui they just they just missed that so i pointed it out and that got fixed so i think you know there's a lot of value in having the graphical user interface, even if you don't use it for everything about creating the model, having the, the graphical user interface where you can quickly view things uh, using different uh, different styles of, of display, um, looking at different properties, looking at different boundary conditions, uh, you know, in context in a consistent framework is very valuable at, at catching these, you know, conceptual problems. Um, and so with that, I believe I will turn it back over to Jeremy. Uh, I'm Jeremy White. I work at Intera, and I'm here to advocate for automation and scripting in predictive groundwater modeling workflows. Now, uh, like Jim said, it is sort of a return to the past in some ways, and it's also embracing some newer techniques from the software development industry. But I want to make sure I focus here on predictive groundwater modeling, right? I'm talking about modeling for decision support. I'm not talking about uh, academic modeling or this hyper-resolution continental baloney. We're talking about real-world groundwater modeling where we build the model for a purpose to make a prediction and we pair the model with some kind of advanced analysis to yield some kind of decision support for stakeholders. So first let me say I'm excited that we are talking about the process of modeling now. Instead of focusing on the model, we're talking about the process of modeling. And I like talking about that because the process of modeling, obviously the way we undertake our modeling analyses, it affects efficiency. It affects the quality of the work product. And I don't mean the model or the report, I mean the decision support capacity. And selfishly, it affects my quality of life, right? Depending on how I do my work, I can lose my weekends pretty quickly <laughs> if I mess things up. And so, you know, my, my friend Mike Feenan, he refers to predictive groundwater modeling workflows as the house of cards. I, uh, I think that's, maybe that's a little rough, but I do think it resembles a bit of a Rube Goldberg machine, right? We have these seemingly unrelated components that are tenuously and laboriously stretched and tucked together to get us to the end result. 
And so in that context, it's natural to wonder, can we optimize predictive groundwater modeling workflows? Can we make them more efficient? Can we get better results? And can we have fun while we do it? And so that's, that's what I'm going to focus on tonight. So let's expand our workflow elements just a little bit. I'm going to use this slide a few more times. So we have model building that's common to all types of computational modeling. And then the modeling analysis part, that's where the unique predictive aspect comes in. And then we have the communication piece at the bottom. So in model building, right, we're going to get data sets from random people emailing things to us or pointing us to weird one drives where we probably get viruses. We're going to scrape things off the internet. We're going to have to process and handle these data and make them into model input formats that are sometimes obscure and proprietary. And then once that works, then we go into the modeling analyses bit, right? There's always the does it work run. And like Jim pointed out, the does it work run is usually much easier when you're in a controlled environment of a GUI. For me, the does it work run usually results in hours of frustration trying to understand what access violation means. <laughs> but once I get through that, then you can start doing these sort of more advanced value added decision support analyses. Like here, this is a subset of a much bigger list. And you're not going to do all of these for every modeling project, but you're going to do at least one of them. I, uh, I really like prior Monte Carlo these days. I'm going to advocate for that a little bit more later, but you know, this is where calibration would be historically or data assimilation and scenario testing, etc. Now, anyone who's done this knows that each one of these little sub bullets contains a lot of assumptions, decisions, options to check or uncheck or turn off, or did I set a zero here or a one here? Lots of handling, lots of operations, which means this thing is fraught with potential for mistakes every step. And this isn't just a you problem or a me problem. This is an industry problem. And this is a computational science problem. There's a really cool paper from Donahoe that really resonated with me where he talks about the ubiquity of error, right? The idea that we need to recognize that our whole groundwater modeling process is going to be full of mistakes and self-delusion and our role as practitioners and as scientists really it should be focused on finding those errors and fixing those errors. Sweet. Let's look at self-delusion for just a moment. This is something I fall for this trap so frequently, right? I'm plugging along with this model and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I have just discovered the most unique groundwater flow system. I'm going to put a paper in nature. I'm going to be big. And then sometime later, it's like, oh, whoops, <laughs> I didn't do the unit conversion for recharge just quite right. Or Oh, you have to divide to form a concentration or general user error across the board, right? This is, this is unavoidable. This is the nature of the beast, as Donahoe points out. But this is where the ubiquity of error runs head on into our Rube Goldberg machine. How long is it going to take to fix this problem? And how many new problems might I introduce while I fix this one? So back to our little chart. Let's say we're over here, and again, this is where we recognize we have a problem with our recharge unit conversion. Oh, let me go back to that and fix that real quick. Maybe you lose an hour. This situation, as John alluded to earlier, I've been in this situation more times than I care to admit, and it is depressing. Talk about quality of life falling off a cliff, right? You're at the end of the project, budget's gone, and now the despair sets in because you realize, oh my God, I have to now re-remember all of those minutiae, all of those steps, all everything I did to get back to this. And it's always on Friday afternoon and it's usually before a holiday weekend, right? So quality of life is toast. But what Donahoe is getting at, it's not going to be just one. There's going to be lots of them. In fact, I would wager this is where the critical thinking and the science in predictive groundwater modeling really happens, right? This is where we're doing numerical experiments with the model. We're trying things. We're using our tenacious groundwater modeler mindset to like just not give up. Why is this happening? I don't understand it. This doesn't make sense. That's this is a typical groundwater modeling exercise, at least for me. So, but the key point then is if we want to raise the quality of the work product, it's not about doing the workflow once. It's about doing the workflow a bunch of times and how quickly can we do that workflow, right? How do you do something repetitive efficiently? Well, one way to do it is like this. This is a directory structure that is sort of the ruins of what was a groundwater modeling project, right? Each one of these directories might represent a numerical experiment trying to solve a problem with the model. Why did this thing look like this over here? You'll notice 
lots of finals and lots of Fridays and lots of final Fridays. Again, this, this is a key indicator of the quality of life of the practitioner who was <laughs> making this model. And so really for me, this push steps into the script so we don't have to remember it so we can do the critical thinking bit but just doing the scripting is not enough right that's living dangerously just having random scripts floating around we want to use version control with the scripting we want to get the original data sets and the scripts into version control so now we have a record to track how are we, how do we recover from these do-overs what did we fix what did we not fix what did we make worse we have this full undo record and then you can also blame your coworkers. That's that's an available option in version control. But more than that, I want to talk about rapid development and iteration, right? It's a concept from software development. And it's centered on this idea of a minimum viable product. And we'll come back to that. But I want to make clear, just as Jim pointed out, going to scripting does not somehow get you out of the problem of making mistakes. And I'll agree with Jim. It might make more mistakes for you because of the scripting piece and maybe some lax coding guidelines. But the, the point is, each one of these little green arrows now for me doesn't represent a lost weekend or banging my head on the keyboard. Quality of life has gone up, right? I am now hanging out at Jackie Treehorn's house. <laughs> so on this idea, though, of rapid development iteration, you know, Hank Hetchema has advocated for a long time about incremental complexity in groundwater modeling, and I completely agree with him. But I'm going to take that a step further. I don't want to just do incremental complexity of model building. I want to do incremental complexity of the full workflow through the modeling analysis also. Because again, that, that is a fundamental piece of predictive groundwater modeling. And so what I'm going to advocate for is that in the first few days of the project, man, get the cheapest model you can get set up and start doing prior Monte Carlo, just basic Monte Carlo with it. Run 10 realizations at lunch, run 50 over the weekend, do what you gotta do. Just keep the thing running, keep testing it, keep looking at the results. Don't wait for the final water use data set because guess what? It's never final. Don't wait for the final layering, it's never final. Just start with what you got and start practicing and get this thing going and then start adding complexity to the process as you go along. And for me at least, the scripting and version control pairing is a nice way to do this sort of rapid iterative cycling. Now, I'm also very interested in collaborating with people, and that's because, again, my own shortcomings, I don't trust my own judgment, I fall for this self-delusion thing a lot, and so I'm desperate to get input from those around me and collaborate in near real time to vet the decisions that might not pan out so well and learn about those before I actually go through the process of trying them. And so that's great, but how do we now collaborate with people in and out of the office randomly on different days or across time zones and somebody's in Egypt and somebody's in New Zealand? Well, the scripting version control thing does seem to work pretty well. I'm, I'm on a project now where someone in Egypt is working on managing a new conceptual model. A person in Austin is working on non-stationary future recharge and somebody else in Albuquerque is working on optimization. And we're all on the same project and we're using this Git repository and these scripts and we just have a few rules about who's going to work on what piece and when we're going to actually do the version control bits. And it, it seems to be working. And then this is sort of the big selling point supposedly with the scripting thing is the flexibility side, right? And every model I work on has something weird about it. Like we're doing a model now with multiple conceptual models where we're running all of those through to posteriors and we're doing scenarios with them. And then there's other places where I'm linking multiple models in weird ways. But obviously the scripting comes to it and do its own here. But for me, you know, this, the, the, my other obsession with ensemble techniques and things has made the need for automation greater just because in the ensemble world, the cost of getting a new set of outputs, is pretty high, right? It's not running the model once, it's running the model for the full ensemble. And so in that respect, if you've got some weird elements in your model and you wanna do the, the ensemble piece, 
it's uh, it's it's hard to do the unique weird things in the ensemble world without scripting i think again free range modeling and as jim said it comes with its own set of challenges so if i was going to decide whether or not i wanted to get into this scripting software to software development driven type of business well if you don't know scripting it's a huge personal professional investment right it's uh it's it's something it's not like riding a bike you don't learn it and put it down it, you're constantly evolving you're constantly reading stack overflow posts and you're trying to hone your craft and get better at it and be better at debugging as jim mentioned and even beyond that once you get the scripting piece comfortable applying that scripting piece in the way i'm talking about for a full stack predictive groundwater modeling workflow will be unbelievably difficult the first time if you don't have somebody with you that's done it before it was really hard for me the first time i did it but the next time it was easier and easier and you start to see the patterns after you've done it a couple times and at the project scale the scripting approach will take a lot more effort early in the project we call this project front loading here's a chart i made playing with beta functions i'm trying to sort of show compare and contrast what i think is is a, a reasonable effort versus time for scripting and GUIs. now assume the area under the curve is the same so it's the same total effort what we see on the bottom down here for the GUIs early time, that's where it's going to be hard to beat the efficiency of the model building capability in setting up the process really quickly and in uh, probably less error prone, as Jim pointed out, early in the project. While the scripting approach, man, you got to hit the ground running. It's a blank canvas. It's an empty text file. You just got to begin. And so it's going to be it's going to be heavy in the in the beginning of the project. But what I see, at least for my quality of life reasons, is those late time project issues and the mistakes pop up it's really just fix the script oh here here's the new spreadsheet i'm not worried about that now i'll just plug it in and go whereas for the gui approach at least in my world when i was using guis you basically take that early time hump and just start replicating it out in the late time because you're kind of having to redo a lot of the steps over again to recover from those late time issues again this is my my experience so what do i like about scripting driven workflows I love the easy do-overs. That's the quality of life issue was it for me. Flexibility is big, easier distributed collaboration. It seems the reproducibility transparency aspect, again, not because of the nerdy science part, but because of, you know. And the thing, again, I really like it seems like we focus on the process of modeling more when we're talking about the script driven workflows. It's more about how do we implement this piece of the workflow or should we make this chart when the model run finishes this time? Those types of and I like the focus on the process for me. What I don't like and this is something we didn't coordinate this, Jim, but yeah, some very obvious errors can go unnoticed longer than they should. A recent one for me was the heads are how far above land surface? I mean, it's like in a GUI, you would have seen that day one, and it wasn't day one when we figured out the heads were above land surface. But maybe it's with better error trapping. Maybe we can do like formal code review kinds of things like you would do in the software development industry. And again, that upfront investment at the project scale, it's, it's hard to split time early because you've really got to focus and lay the framework out for this workflow sufficiently well early And so again, in closing, does it have to be an or? How do scripts and GUIs interoperate? Uh, I'm really interested in sort of capitalizing on that, that efficiency, early time build, error trapping piece that the GUIs bring with the ability to then handle the do-overs later. And I don't know what that looks like. I mean, I would, I'm open for discussion if anybody wants to talk about that. Anyway, that's my bit. Okay, um, well, thanks both for excellent talks. Uh, we had agreed when planning this that, Jim, if you want to have two minutes now just to, to uh, meet any arguments that Jeremy made, Jeremy, you can have another two minutes and then it's open to the floor if you want that two minutes. So, Jim, do you want to say anything now? No, I just, uh, you know, I think, I think we're on the same page, you know. Um, Typically, when I use scripting, I, you know, I use the GUI to develop it. 
<clears throat> to develop the first model because it, it will point out you know problems it's easier to see problems uh and then if i have to do you, you know you know the monte carlo or the, the parameter estimation and things like that you know a lot of times i will script that um you know and then um but i think i think the only thing i would slightly disagree with is you know the the effort curve you showed i think at the end um you know the guis are pretty good at you know pulling whatever you've done through scripting you know back in and that's a easy step so i don't think you lose i don't think it's as much time at the end um as as maybe you're thinking but i mean i do agree i do agree in general with uh with what you said there jeremy mm. Well, that's not being very argumentative. Jeremy, do you want to say, <laughs> do you want to write a reply? That's hardly yeah, worth replying to that agreement. I guess, um, at least in my experience, and I, I used to think I was a good Groundwater Vistas user. Like, I could navigate and run those things. But it did feel like, and maybe this was just a time in my life when I had little babies at home, that I was spending a lot of time at the office on Saturday and the damn air conditioner was off. And I'm just like trying to remember the step and then, okay, wait for that to run and then do this. And so I, I do like, and to me, it, it felt like there was more late time effort than what I'm putting in now with the scripting stuff. And then maybe that's on purpose because I'm designing the scripting stuff to be sort of ready for that later. Whereas I, I found it harder to sort of anticipate how I was going to cope with the, oh, what do you mean that's the spreadsheet I'm supposed to be using? You know, like <laughs> nobody told me this until now. And so at least in my world it seems like it it's very little effort later in the project compared to what it was before but maybe that's my also my own inadequacies as well well i think you know i think it comes down to what your expertise is you know and when you're as comfortable with coding as you are i will agree it's much better to just go with what you're most comfortable with you know and um you know i I'm at a, an advantage with Groundwater Vistas because I coded it, and so I have, I have a lot of um, internal functions that no one has access to but me, um, but which which fundamentally then becomes scripting, right? I mean, a lot of tough stuff that I do personally, I'm using Groundwater Vistas, but I, but it's really internal scripting. It's it's really the same types types of things that you're doing. So I I, I definitely agree with you on that. So then I would say. When are we going to get access to these internal scripting tools, Jim? Because <laughs> that's, you know, I keep hearing this legend about, you know, that the petroleum people have these GUIs where you can, you know, you select all your options and you build your model. And then there's some sort of magic that brings this thing out into an, a y, an XML file or a script of some kind. It's basically like, oh, here's the options you just did if you want to do it again from the command line. And I think, I mean, I would love to see something like that because I would be all over that. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, I, I've been working on trying to do some sort of scripting in, you know, with with the GUI. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been a it's been a struggle. But I think I finally come up with something that will work. And so I'm hoping that within the next year or two that that there will be that cap that capability, like, you know, instead of using a script in Python or, some, or you know, something like that to build to build the model. You know, it'll be a script that you can run in Groundwater Vistas to do the model, and it would do the, essentially do the same thing. And and that way, it would be very reproducible and very quick. Mm -hmm. You know, to start over. I mean, that's my goal. It, it's difficult, right? It's <laughs> you know, I, I I have a lot of respect for the folks that wrote Python. 